Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ryan Berg, and I'm the director of the Americas program at CSIS. Thank you for joining us this morning for a conversation on mining, climate risks, and the Western Hemisphere. Before we formally begin, let's take care of some logistics. This discussion will last approximately 60 minutes. Following the panelists' remarks and a moderated discussion, we will field questions from the audience. Please submit any questions you have by clicking on the Ask Live Questions link on the event webpage or use the Ask Questions function in Zoom. You can find that below on your Zoom screen. Again, thank you for joining us this morning. It has become increasingly apparent that achieving clean energy goals will require increases across the board in mining. By virtually any metric, the energy transition will also be a minerals and metals transition. The average electric car requires six times the mineral inputs compared to combustion engine vehicles. The electrification of transit networks, building renewable energy infrastructure, and sustaining industrial production are estimated to drive demand for 700 million tons of additional copper production by 2030. Meanwhile, the average American is now estimated to consume 3 million tons of minerals, metals, and fuels over the course of his or her lifetime. However, there's a disconnect between the projected need for vastly increased mineral production and the practical steps needed to open new mines and expand existing ones. If we are to sustainably meet demand for critical minerals and other key resources, the United States, regional partners, and mining companies must align incentives and reconcile the tension between the need to expand production with the environmental and social considerations of affected communities. For Latin America, a global mining renaissance offers the potential to energize economic growth but may also exacerbate existing political tensions. In Chile, for example, a proposed multi-billion dollar iron and copper mine was struck down recently over concerns about environmental effects. In neighboring Peru, unrest has prompted the blockade of mines throughout one of the Western Hemisphere's copper powerhouses, putting at least 2% of the global copper production on hold. These events further underscore how responsible mining practices are becoming increasingly important for mines to insulate themselves from political contestation. For their part, major mining companies are recognizing these tensions and taking steps to correct them. Industry standards and best practices are calling for early and sustained consultations with communities impacted by mining. While some mines have invested hundreds of millions of dollars into development projects and efforts to mitigate local environmental externalities. The United States, meanwhile, can do more to encourage responsible mining with its partners throughout the hemisphere. Trade agreements can help channel investment more effectively to begin the often decades-long process of opening a new mine. Meanwhile, new mechanisms such as the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity, or APEP, can be useful channels to open a broader conversation about mining and the energy transition between the United States and its partners and allies in the region. But there's no time to waste. Identifying new mines and expanding current ones takes time that we can ill afford. And it is critical to think through the role mining can play in the Western Hemisphere's economic and environmental future today. For this reason, we've convened a superlative panel of experts this morning to bring their analytical and hands-on experience to the conversation on meeting mineral demand for the energy transition in a sustainable and responsible way. Our first speaker is Dr. Morgan Bazilian, a non-resident senior associate with the CSIS Energy and Security, Energy Security and Climate Change Program as well as Executive Director of the Payne Institute for Earth Resources and Research Professor of Public Policy at the Colorado School of Mines. Dr. Bazilian has over two decades of experience in the energy sector and is regarded as a leading expert in international affairs, policy, and investment. Our, our second speaker is Veronica Shimei, Vice President of International Policy and Sustainability with the National Mining Association. Veronica has extensive experience working in the mining sector on international relations, trade policy, and environmental, social, and governance challenges. And our final speaker is George Kahati, Foreign Affairs Officer and Critical Minerals Team Lead at the Office of Energy Transformation in the State Department. He has also served as Acting U.S. Representative to the Kimberley Process, working with domestic and international partners from governments, private sector, and NGOs to promote conflict-free supply chains, and strengthen international cooperation on critical minerals. I've asked each one of our excellent panelists this morning to provide some framing remarks of about five minutes before we move into a moderated discussion. Dr. Bazilian, over to you for your opening remarks. 
Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, sorry, I couldn't be in DC today. I have uh, fond memories of CSI S events on all kinds of topics in the uh, energy and climate space, and was pleased to see uh, Thera's new role in the White House and the National Security Council. Um, this is great timing for this meeting, as it's great timing for a new narrative on mining and minerals. The opportunity for the mining industry is enormous, um, maybe the best one in, 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 a, in its history to change the dynamics, change the narrative of mining towards something that is um, widely considered positive by society and supportive of our goals for modern economies for clean energy, for modern defense and national security. The groups of critical minerals we normally hear about, they change depending on who you, who you are or what your, what your needs are. It's not a homogenous group. In the United States, we have a list of 50 critical minerals. It used to be 35. And rather than going down, which is what you would normally do to focus on something, the list uh, went up and, and, and other um, associations are, are vying to get on that list. Um, they're not a homogenous group. As I said, that they have different stakeholders, different supply chains, different markets, different scales. And so treating them as one thing um, tends to not work very well. The analogies to oil and gas for security purposes between critical minerals and oil and gas can be useful to an extent, but it's an imperfect analogy, um, especially because of my previous point. In policy, priorities and politics matter a great deal and they change rapidly. So it is great to see the window opening and people like um, uh, our panelists from the State Department having priorities on critical minerals um, without the topic continuing to raise up the, the priority list, um, precious little will get done. These systems we're talking about are not just technical systems, they're socio-technical systems. What that means is that they, you must think of them in terms of how they interact with society. And for hundreds of years, uh, the, the issues of social license and, and permitting such as they were, are, are fundamental, they're also messy and they take a long time to change. Um, they take even longer to change if we don't have prioritization of this area. Um, with, the, with, the, with the global energy crisis, what we've seen in energy markets is government intervention is back in a big way. What that means is you have to reconsider how you understand how markets function. And that's true for several of the critical minerals. For the first time, I suppose ever, the price of some things like uh, solar panels, photovoltaics and batteries are rising. And at least part of that rise is due to the material inputs to these uh, advanced technologies. Of course, inflationary tendencies and currency and risk play their role as usual, but this is the first time they're rising because um, in large part because of the mineral inputs. Um, how we ensure that there's real value add for developing economies in this new narrative of mining is essential. So that's not just about resource curse, but in the Western hemisphere, how the countries engage uh, in this area and make the new mining narrative positive for their own country, not just for the United States is very important. And we can see that playing out uh, uh, poignantly in Peru uh, right now uh, and Chile and Bolivia. Um, and while the supply chains across these things are not homo hom homogenous, it's an essential way to frame how to think about these things. So if we think about critical minerals solely from a mining perspective, we miss almost everything. So the resiliency of that full supply chain is key and many countries don't necessarily start at the beginning. And so if you, if, 
that that is upstream uh, for the mining itself. So you won't really need to consider how the supply chain will impact an economy. And most economies get much more value add from the advanced manufacturing than they do from the, the supply side. Uh, governance is worth pursuing and, and keeping high on the priority list. And this includes the evolution of markets. The markets for most of these critical minerals are illiquid, uh, non-transparent, and have poor price discovery. That's a big problem for investment. Yes, we have to work with allies. Uh, the government, the new administration has made that clear. Uh, took a little while. Um, but not just as proxies for an economic war with China, as, as, as proper uh, allies developing a, a set of robust and resilient and transparent supply chains. The reason um, the, the critical minerals have risen up the priority scale in the United States is primarily due to the US-China economic war or great power competition, or however you want to phrase it. Um, so that's useful in rising up the prioritization. Uh, it's also a very tense situation that, uh, by all accounts, is likely to get more tense. And finally, we're not going to change a global paradigm of a set of 50 different supply chains in a matter of weeks or even years. And while there's been great uh, movement and investment and announcements, um, that paradigm does does not shift quickly. And so um, things need to be uh, understood in terms of decadal change. Um, I, I'll stop my comments there. And again, very uh, delighted to be with you on this uh, impressive panel. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Bazilian, for those opening remarks. I'm gonna go over to Veronica now for her opening remarks. Great, thanks so much. Thanks CSIS for inviting me and good morning to everybody on the line. Um, I don't think that anyone here really disputes the anticipated increase in demand for critical minerals. And frankly, we as an industry are really happy to have society reconnect with the sector and its value to our quality of life and vision for the future. It's in everyone's best interest to promote clean and safe development of mining resources, providing economic stability and geopolitical security, and really what society needs for critical technologies necessary to achieve these net zero emissions. To that end, it's paramount to develop a domestic policy and infrastructure that eliminates unnecessary burdens to mineral production and exports and makes companies more competitive and encourages global trade. Some examples are promoting efficient permitting processes, regu reducing regulatory uncertainties, and developing supportive infrastructure and trade policies that support this critical sector specifically. Now, I know that we're focusing this session on Chile and Peru, Latin America, and we'll focus on trade, however, just so everyone knows, permitting reform and infrastructure development are necessary priorities for us here as well in the United States, mm -hmm. where we have our operators focusing on really high ESG practices, I may add. But as well, this will be necessary to meet the supply chain needs globally. So recently, trade policy really has not been creating an enabling environment for the mining sector. We encourage clear trade policy that protects and accounts for the critical nature of mining operations, allowing for uninterrupted responsible production that provides the extensive economic benefits for host governments, communities here at home and the global supply chain. In trade, we support general foundations of good policy, like uh, such as encouraging free flow of goods and services among highly integrated economies, strict enforcement of trade agreements, protecting intellectual property and technologies, and then also specific trade priorities for our sector that are necessary for supporting our sector, like um, highlighting the criticality of the mining sector in general. We saw this happening during COVID-19 when the mining sector was highlighted as a critical industry and allowed to remain open. 
Some may say that we're in a similar state of emergency regarding the government's goals towards um, net zero and the criticality of mining should really be enshrined in trade policy. Investor protections are paramount and were actually omitted um, the mining sector was omitted in the renegotiating of renegotiated USMCA. So now two mines are right now being arbitrarily shut down by the Mexican government. If we don't have our foreign direct investment protected by our trade agreements, that investment and will not happen and you will not have good operators you're seeking to have in your countries. Providing long-term business certainty is key for our sector, 10 years plus. This was also something omitted from USMCA. I think they uh, allow for a 10-year timeline horizon in USMCA that you start renegotiating six years in. Many countries' operations can't even get a permit in 10 years. And in an industry with such long timeline horizons as the mining sector, business certainty is key for investors and companies. Another trade priority is precluding that nationalistic language and policies and trade agreements. By including nationalistic language keeps good operators out of the countries and will have significant ESG implications. Lastly, on trade, people often forget the benefit of tax treaties. Tax treaties are a great way policies can support business development or thwart it. The United States, um, the U.S. Chile Income Tax Treaty, for example, remains stuck and unratified since 2010. The treaty is vitally important to U.S. foreign direct investment in Chile, and without ratification, U.S. companies and operations for U.S. companies will raise to the tax rate of 44%. By comparison, Chilean operations of companies headquartered in China, Japan, Canada, Australia, and U.K., will be subject to a rate of 35%, putting US companies at a significant disadvantage in relation to their competitors. We obviously support these policies and hope to get good operators like our members developing more assets here in the United States and internationally. We feel like this is the best win-win scenario for shoring up secure supply chains and having the most positive impact on the ground and with communities. I look forward to this discussion with CSIS and thanks for organizing and everybody participating. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica, for those opening remarks. Uh, George, over to you for your opening remarks. Um, thank you very much and uh, good morning to all. It's great to be here with uh, such a distinguished panel and um, such a great audience. Thank you to CSIS for inviting me and, and again, hosting this uh, really important conversation today. By way of introduction, uh, my name is George Kayati and I'm the lead of a, a growing minerals team at, at the State Department's Bureau of Energy Resources. I think as a recognition of the importance of these issues, um, we, we have been dedicating more resources uh, in the department to what is essentially a, a relatively new policy area for us. Um, in my brief remarks, I'd like to uh, touch on three items. I'd like to highlight the importance of recent legislation uh, and then go into how the State Department is complementing these domestic efforts with international engagement. And finally, I'll say a few words about the type of activities uh, my bureau, the Bureau of Energy Resources, is pursuing in the Western Hemisphere. So first of all, um, clearly the Biden-Harris administration is committed to climate goals and has taken historic action to advance these goals. Uh, these will have profound implications for the critical mineral supply chains and clean technologies that depend on them. Um, and it's obviously part of the, the, the equation that kind of um, that, that Morgan alluded to. Uh, it is difficult to overstate the importance of the Inflation Reduction Act or the IRA. An infusion of $369 billion into our climate and clean energy efforts. The US market is the world's most agile and mobilizing finance. And the IRA reinforces this and will play a key role in delivering capital 
to clean technologies that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The IRA complements the bipartisan infrastructure laws, historic investments in emissions reducing infrastructure from electric vehicle chargers to power grid upgrades that will facilitate the expansion of renewables and clean energy. As an example of the scale of these investments, uh, I think the, there was one announcement on October 19th uh, this or last year, where the administration awarded it, just in one round $2.8 billion in grants from the bipartisan infrastructure law to 20 manufacturing and processing companies for essentially battery minerals to expand um, the manufacturing base in that space. Um, not only was this kind of an infusion from uh, the US government, uh, it was essentially matched by the private sector and as a total ended up leveraging a total of uh, $9 billion. Um, and this is only one example. Domestic efforts are historic and a crucial part um, of global efforts to combat the climate crisis, but we know we cannot do this alone. We need the private sector, we need private sector partners, and we need international partners, and we need stakeholders like the National Mining Association and the Payne Institute and broader Colorado School of Mines uh, family. This is why the Bureau of Energy Resources is leading US government cooperation internationally on critical minerals in close consultation with the interagency and a broad range of stakeholders. This brings me to the Mineral Security Partnership or MSP, which we established in June of 2022 with like-minded governments to accelerate the development of secure, diverse and sustainable supply chains specifically for critical energy, minerals, and metals. The MSP aims to catalyze public and private investment in strategic projects along the value chain through targeted financial and diplomatic support. The MSP is considering projects in both within MSP partners' borders and in non-partner countries. The MSP welcomes the opportunity to work together with outside countries and commits to support only those projects that meet high ESG standards, promote local value addition, and uplift communities in recognition that all countries should benefit from the global clean energy transition. The MSP additionally aims to use partners' economic engagement and other forms of support to essentially make strategic minerals projects more likely to succeed or to come to fruition more quickly. MSP activities will advance the economic objectives of both MSP partners and non-MSP partners. Uh, most recently in September last year, MSP partners hosted a ministerial on the margins of the United Nations General Assembly high level week, including men many minerals rich countries, not part of the MSP, including uh, countries in the Western hemisphere. We discuss priorities, opportunities, and challenges faced by countries developing their natural resources and seeking to attract diverse foreign investment and advance value-added industry. We plan on continuing consultations with non-MSP partners and specifically, well, in a couple of weeks, uh, we will have a, a big team traveling to Cape Town, South Africa for the Mining and Daba Conference for additional consultations. Uh, finally, I'll touch on the, some of the activities that the Bureau, my Bureau, um, has been pushing in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and essentially over the years, we've had a legacy of successful strategic technical engagements on minerals, clean energy integration, and e-mobility throughout the hemisphere. The Bureau of Energy Resources works in Latin America and the Caribbean region to build energy sector capacity, improve regulatory frameworks, foster good business practices to accelerate the energy transition and promote trade and investment opportunities for US companies. In the past few years, a lot of this work has refocused to um, the mining sector given its, its increasing importance. By encouraging governments to create stronger regulatory frameworks, 
the region will attract the investment it needs to sustainably develop its natural resources and pursue clean energy transition, which includes strengthening and diversifying the supply chains, clean energy integration, and e-mobility. Increasing demand for clean energy and electric vehicle technologies will create a commensurate, unprecedented demand for the minerals and metals that make the energy transition possible, many of which are located in this hemisphere. More and more consumers and investors are insisting that mines adhere to strict environmental, social, and governance criteria. And we see this as an opportunity because American companies are, are leaders in this space. With that, um, I will, I look forward to the discussion and look forward to answering any questions, but I will pass the mic back to Ryan. Thank you. Thank you very much, George, for those opening remarks. And uh, I do want to open up the, the moderated portion of our discussion now. Uh, I want to remind folks who are on this call, if something has sparked your interest, if you want to ask a question, you can either go to the website and click on Ask Live Questions. We'll filter uh, the questions from there and, and ask them in the Q&A portion of our event today. Or you can go to the bottom of your Zoom screen where you see the button Q&A and you can start filling the queue with some, some of your questions. And I see that two of you have already done that. Um, I wanna start the moderated portion of our discussion essentially right where George left off, which was this discussion of the, the flurry of, of legislative activity and interest we've seen in the US thus far. And I wanna ask both Morgan and Veronica to comment on not the domestic aspects of the legislation, because I feel like George covered that well, but the international implications of some of the things that he mentioned, the Mineral Security Partnership, the CHIPS Act, the Transportation Bill, the Inflation Reduction Act. How might some of these pieces of legislation impact differently upon mining operations outside of the United States and in particular in the Western Hemisphere? Uh, because I think George did a good job explaining domestic implications. But uh, I want to go to you first, Morgan, and then and then to you, Veronica. Anything that you're seeing on the international front, opportunities that come from, from this flurry of domestic legislation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ryan. Um, and great comments. Uh, uh, I learned a lot from Veronica and George there. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I'd say is uh, carrying an Irish... Uh, passport. It's um, terribly annoying to have to say IRA all the time. Um, we uh, look, there's, there's already been a domestic, there's already been an international response to the flurry of activity under those bills that George mentioned. We, we mostly saw the responses coming from Europe in terms of uh, subsidies and the way Europe and the member states of the European Union, let alone the countries outside of the European Union, deal with subsidies through rules under state aids uh, is very different than how the United States does it. And so the, there was an immediate um, response. I don't think it was hyperbolic. I think it was uh, a genuine concern um, in, in competition. So that, that that's one area that, that covers sort of everything under the subsidy heading, not just the critical minerals piece. Um, you know, the, the work that George and his team and the others at the State Department are doing is superb. It does, th there was something called the ERGI, the Energy Resource Governance Initiative under the last administration, which they've roughly stayed with in, in, in spirit. I'm not sure about in name, but I, I think that that's an actually very um, good thing. It's one of the few areas where, where you know, there wouldn't have been a, 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 a change utterly in, in, in from the past administration, that there was a recognition that working with allies um, to prioritize the kind of issues Veronica spoke about, about trade and um, risk uh, funding uh, and lowering risk for companies in the United States is really important and that it takes a long time. So I'm happy to see what the State Department is doing on the Minerals Partnership. Uh, it does that one piece that I said was so important, it prioritizes it. And the fact that George has a team and they're growing uh, is, is very important. And I'll just finish with the CHIPS Act, which I think is um, the most powerful driver 
uh, for economics and change right now of those three across supply chains is the CHIPS Act because it's most clearly focused on this great power competition with China. It, you know, it, it, it's unapologetically focused on economic, essentially warfare with China across a supply chain of advanced manufacturing, even though it's not um, written that way as such. It, well, it pretty much is written that way. Um, so I think that that CHIPS Act and how that plays out vis-a-vis -vis China um, and the, the wider global security issues is going to be very important for, for the sort of more specific area of critical minerals for energy transitions we're sort of focused on. Um, but really exciting legislation with enormous international impacts. Um, and the responses have been, well, on both sides, as you might expect. Thank you very much, Dr. Bazilian. Over to you, Veronica. Anything that you're seeing um, that's Western Hemisphere specific opportunities that might have arisen from the flurry of, of legislative and executive activity in the past uh, year and a half to two years? Sure. Thanks, Ryan. Um, obviously, money and focus is great. And that's what this, these legislation provide for the sector. But ultimately, if we don't have real action, that catalyzing real action and, and permitting, for example, to happen on the ground, then I'm afraid we're not going to meet the goals of, you know, 300 mines developing to meet future um, supply chain demands. And so I would have to say it's permitting, as Morgan mentioned, also processing, and it's the infrastructure, and then the trade, you know, it, it's great that that MSP is working with our allies and focusing on specific projects. And we really hope that we can work collaboratively to ensure that the projects identified really fit into what's necessary and into where we have gaps and risks in the supply chain. I really like what Morgan mentioned also about making sure we look at the entire supply chain, the beginning to the end, because if we leave certain parts out, that won't be able to happen. And getting US operators or operate companies operating in the US to ensure that high ESG bar is maintained so that with the increase in mining, we don't have negative impact. We can have a continued positive impact across the board. Thank you, Veronica. George, I wanna to go to you with a question specifically about, uh, about licensing or about certification procedures. Uh, because you worked on the Kimberly process, and so I think you'd be well positioned to to answer uh, this question. And it's, what role do independent certification procedures play in encouraging sustainable and socially licensed mining? And should policymakers encourage more mines and more mining companies to meet these certification standards? You talk, talked about this a little bit in your opening remarks. But what are your thoughts on, on that as uh, one of the key drivers of getting to more social license? So I think, I mean, they, they are fundamental pieces. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of this kind of derives from um, the OECD uh, the guidelines for multinational enterprises, um, from commitments that, that many companies uh, are, are dedicated to under the, the UN guiding principles. Um, the, this becomes even more important today, right? Because we're gonna see new markets develop, new resources being developed around the world. I think the IEA's figure for lithium is that it'll increase, the demand for lithium will increase uh, 40 to 42 times uh, it, by, now, by 2040. Um, this, this creates a lot of disruption um, and if done quickly and, and not well, um, it will lead to a number of negative externalities in, in producing countries uh, along the supply chains. Um, we do think because ultimately supply chains are run by the private sector and private sector actors are at each stage of, of the supply chain, um, they are best positioned to uh, essentially uh, police those supply chains. And 
for these for various risks. The um, those certification schemes, because of the the cost of actually monitoring um, for these risks is so big, um, the certification certification schemes kind of um, provide economies of scale for the due diligence piece. Um, and so are, are really useful. I've, I've used to work on um, Dodd-Frank 1502 implementation, um, which relates to conflict minerals and required companies to look at their supply chains specifically for conflict related risks in, in the DRC. Um, but companies came together and essentially uh, New, new entities came out of it to, to provide kind of a more um, concentrated uh, tool to, to get at due diligence throughout their supply chains. Thank you very much, George. I, I wanna get to the stakes here um, and we might move from the tone and tenor of optimism that we've had so far in the conversation to uh, to to the to the dire, and I want to start with uh, with Morgan on on this. Um, and basically, the question is, you know, what happens if we don't get this right? Um, what will happen if the world confronts the supply crunch that we have all talked about in our opening remarks? What does it look? What does our world look like in 2030, 2040 when um, we have this this demand, as we've all mentioned? reaching its 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 apex and we don't have the the supply there to to meet that demand give us a sense of what you think that world looks like well um Ryan I, I never predict the future I'm uh too old and uh, um, um have had too many experiences doing that uh, incorrectly like 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 everybody else but I I would say that um some of the things we can do to hedge against this sort of, you know, has ex been explained in some hyperbolic terms is that, um, that, that are not necessarily highest on the agenda are one is um, have a focus on markets and the functioning of markets across those supply chains. So right now what we see across many of those minerals is very small markets. And I've already talked about, uh, their transparency and that price discovery piece is essential. So if if a if a company, um, you know, an NMA company or some someone else is looking to make a very long term investment, which which these things are, um, and they have very little faith in rightfully in in, in the current pricing uh, of markets, or it's priced in yuan, or it's it's, it's priced on a market that that stops trading like we saw in nickel last year on the London Metals Exchange, you have very difficult signals in an already very risky environment. And so I think that that focus on evolving the markets to be more sophisticated and, and functioning better is, is key to this because what we don't have, of course, in, in, in this mining area is an actual resource constraint. We have a functioning mining and processing constraint right so um if so that's a different kind of issue in, in some ways that we faced and when we you know used to start thinking about energy security in earnest in, in the 70s in the united states right so there's lots of this stuff and it's a matter of 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 dealing with the issues and i do agree with uh, veronica that the fundamental one here is going to be permitting and your language that you know, permitting comes from social license, and social license comes from is is a is a tough term. You, you, it, there's there's no um, cl clear one or two levers that alters how social license decisions are made, and so we have to embrace the complexity, which is sort of easy for an academic to say, and much harder for a company to actually deal with. Um, and I think we're seeing some positive moves. We saw. Veronica can correct me, but uh, Lithium America is making some uh, important deals with uh, First Nations tribes um, recently and changing that narrative overall. So going back to what I said first, which is 
you have this historic opportunity for the mining industry to fundamentally change their narrative about being a core part of modern economies moving to where they want to move. And um, that can then uh, help the social license, which can then help the permitting, which can then help the investment and risk profiles of these things. Um, look, just to finish, it, it, what does it look like if we get all of that wrong? I, I, I expect we'll get a lot of that wrong. And so, um, you know, I, I don't see the hyperbolic, you know, dismal future, but one of the things that will have to change as we start to get these things wrong is that this area actually rises up the political prioritization, not falls back. So if it falls back, then that's a really bad sign. So if it, if it comes back down, George's group is disbanded or, or whatever, moved to some other priority, um, then you can move to the future you describe much more easily. Thank you very much, Maureen. I think George might have just had a heart attack when you mentioned uh, his group <laughs> being being disbanded. I saw his eyes get get quite. I'm long. sure it won't, George. Sorry. <laughs> Over to you, Veronica. Uh, do you want to? At CSIS, we're asked to look into the crystal ball quite quite frequently, and so uh, you know, my question to you is: is Do you have any sense of of what this is going to look like if we if we get some of these things wrong? Give us a sense of of the stakes. And do you agree with Morgan that? Um, we are likely to uh, to fall behind and and perhaps not get get some of these these things right. Um, I do agree with Morgan. Um, I think we're already not getting it right because we don't actually see projects being actually developed on the ground. We don't see that the impact of these decisions at the higher levels of many countries having an impact on the ground. And until we see mines being opened or and processing facilities being onshored and people thinking of the entire supply chain. I mean, we're, we're, I feel like, unfortunately, now I realize why you said the negative part of the session is going to start now, because we're not, we're not being successful. And hopefully we can um, turn it around and, and really start making some things happen on the ground. I just can't stress it enough because Nothing else can be happen unless that supply chain is supported by these critical minerals. Um, I also agree with Mo Morgan was talking about that social license. That social license is key. And I, I think our companies have really been working on that for decades now. And we talk about social license a lot. We talk about early, uh, early and effective communication. And now that that is even starting to evolve to, it's not about early and effective communication, it's about early and effective collaboration because it's not about checking boxes or just communicating something to your communities or the indigenous peoples or the groups, your key stakeholders. It's about that, it's about effective collaboration because everybody should be benefiting from resource development and that's what we're working towards. Thank you, Veronica. Um, and I, I like what Morgan said about social license as well. It's easy for us as scholars uh, and, and academics to say uh, we need to embrace the, the complexity. It's much harder to, to actually do it. Um, listen, we've had a lot of really great questions coming into the Q&A. We've had a number of questions being submitted on the online platform. I want to go to those now uh, because some of them are, are really, really good. And I, I want to point the first one. Uh, in your direction, George, and, and it's specifically about uh, government and, and government's role. Given that foreign defense forces are charged with internal security of their national assets, how might U.S. DOD engagements with ministry level leaders reinforce or support broader U.S. efforts? So understanding that you're at the State Department, um, how are you all thinking about other agencies, particularly the, the DOD, and how they might engage to advance some some of your goals, given especially, and I think this question was in the context of Latin America, um, defense forces being uh, critical to to the defense of national assets in partner and ally countries in the hemisphere. So I think I mean as a top line, the the efforts on on critical minerals are a a whole of government effort. Um, the kind of the the first shot from the administration on critical mineral supply chains was uh, an executive order that that basically was issued within the first 
month and a half of the administration, uh, the executive order on America's supply chains. Um, 14017 for, for people that want to actually look it up. Um, the, there is close collaboration with the Department of Defense on a lot of these supply chain issues. Uh, the Department of State with the Department of Energy uh, assigned an MOU with DOD. Now this was related to the stockpile, so not to the US um, national defense stockpile, not the uh, not kind of uh, arrangements with security forces uh, abroad, but it's kind of an example of, of how close that collaboration is. Um, the, I'm not sure, I'm a little out of my depth on the question of uh, kind of how to engage DOD uh, in, in essentially collaborating with, with forces abroad. Um, but when, when that question does arise in specific instances, because of this whole of government effort, we have already created the connective tissue with the other agencies to be able to act quickly. And so I think that is um, the number of agencies involved in this space now uh, and the, the level of collaboration and the amount of time we spend talking to each other, I think has increased remarkably and will lead to payoffs uh, in the future as far as good outcomes go. Thank you, George. We've gotten a number of questions, about three by my count, about the supply chains, uh, in particular, control of supply chains and, and supply chains for refining uh, products. And so what I'm going to do is collapse a lot of these questions in, into, into one and ask you all to, to weigh in on it, because I think it's an important question. Uh, and it's basically, uh, besides, the, the question is basically, you know, besides uh, expanding the extraction of minerals in a responsible way, uh, what can be done to nearshore the refining capacity of minerals, which China kernel currently dominates? Understanding that this is a completely separate discussion, but just sort of your top line thoughts on that. And I'll start with you, Morgan, and then go to Veronica and, and finish with, with George. Well, just for a top line thought, I, I would say, um, you know, I, I'm a uh, professor at, at one of the world's best mining engineering universities and uh, training of uh, professionals to do processing was almost entirely offshore to China um, decades ago, primarily for environmental and economic reasons. Um, so to bring it back is not uh, as simple as moving a switch. Um, we have very few trained professionals who can operate these kind of processing and refining plants. Um, the investments under the recent investments from the, the government are, are good signs, but we need a, a sort of dramatically uh, shift that um, training. Uh, it's, it's possible to do it. It takes, it takes a while. It takes a generation to, 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 to get those students in, to train them up and to have them become uh, professional. So it's not a short-term one. That I, I could make other comments about China, but why don't I just stay with the top line uh, uh, comment? Thank you, Morgan. Your thoughts on this, uh, Veronica? Yeah, I agree with Morgan. The mining sector is experiencing the, the negative ramifications of the skills gap globally um, at all levels. And I'm sure it's at the processing and refining level as well. The processing and refining to onshore them in the United States, and I'm sure other countries would require the same permitting that um, mines, well, different permitting, but the, the, the bureaucracy that would inhibit onshoring very quickly. And so we don't see that happening now either, so. Thank you, Veronica. George, uh, anything to, to weigh in here on, on um, the nearshoring aspect? Again, this is about three or so questions that I've collapsed into one. I mean, I'll say just really briefly that, first of all, at a government level, there's a clear recognition that processing um, and the concentration of processing is uh, potentially the, the larger risk in the supply chain for, for a lot of these minerals. Um, I think what you see in the $2.8 billion DOE uh, kind of 
grant tranche is a clear articulation of, of what the administration is trying to do to, to fix that. Um, on the mineral security partnership, from the mineral security partnership perspective, I would just uh, highlight that we are not only focused on mining, we are focused, we are looking at processing projects and recycling projects. Uh, and so that is kind of from the State Department, uh, one piece of the answer. But certainly processing doesn't work if we don't have new mines. So um, we're looking at all the, the various angles. Thanks, George. Uh, there's another question, and it's a Latin America specific question, thinking about the, the investment landscape and, and things that might need to be done in, in Latin America to boost investment um, in, in, the, in the mining space. Do any of you have thoughts on, on that, uh, things that either we could do from the U.S. side or Latin American countries could do in partnership with us to boost investments in the, in the mining space? I'm sure Veronica does. Veronica, do you want to weigh in here? I mean, I really don't want to sound like a broken record, but um, it's a, a regulatory atmosphere that provides business certainty to investors and to companies so that they know that that investment will not become an orphan investment, which is what we see happening a lot of times in the United States and with our foreign direct investment. And it's the trade policies that that incentivize good operators operating in all of these countries. Um, Thanks, yeah, Veronica. Just, just, just to say that, Go ahead, that's, that, that's of course the right answer. Um, it's the same answer you would get in almost any sector, right? If, for American companies to operate, it, it's all about risk. And um, we see that in extractive industries that the risk of those things, especially in countries where they're going through constitutional issues or conflict issues like we're seeing, again, very poignantly in Peru and, and Chile, uh, and the risks in Bolivia for investment are significant. Um, what you're also seeing is China investing in those places. So they do not have the same uh, investment concerns. Do, their calculus is very different in terms of risk uh, in those countries than ours is. And so um, diplomacy uh, and George's group plays a big role there, um, but th those are not new issues. Um, but what, what is kind of new is, is now all of a sudden um, people in the United States paying attention to constitutional issues in Chile or, 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 or conflict in Peru around mining specifically. Um, and those are uh, significant and not easily written off by a uh, investment house in the United States for for risk. You know, um, I think that I didn't want to point the finger directly at China, but that is the real concern, you know, that you then get operators in your countries that don't operate under the higher ESG bar that um, other companies from other countries are operating under. And then the host country really re has the impact, that negative impact. And that is why we continue to have this perception of mining that is not as high as it should be. Um, when I worked at the World Bank, I saw firsthand the impact that Chinese companies had in many African countries and in Zambia. And so our hope is that we can help countries create an atmosphere that would attract the good operators to your country so that everybody can um, not can improve their quality of life and not kind of fall in this resource curse that we've experienced in past decades. Thanks, Veronica. Uh, let's go to potentially a feel-good way to end the, to end the event. And there's a, a question from one of the participants on um, any examples or best practices that you've witnessed uh, to manage skepticism from local indigenous communities or indigenous territories. Um, are there examples that we can point to of, of ways that companies or countries are thinking creatively um, about creating uh, what we've described in this uh, conversation as social license or greater social license? Um, any examples or best practices or good paths forward that you'd like to point to? And I'll start with you, Morgan, you've, you've uh, volunteered. Yeah, I, I think that's an extremely important point and um, one 
that is starting to get more attention here. Um, we work uh, um, closely with the Southern Ute Indian tribe, which is a tribe that has uh, its land in the Southwest part of Colorado. They have an extremely sophisticated portfolio of investments and have been dealing with the issues of their own sovereignty, as well as how to sustainably and responsibly develop, in this case, the natural gas that they have access to. And I think there's a lot of lessons from different tribes, especially perhaps this one, on how to do that effectively, how to deal with, how they deal with companies, how they deal with federal oversight, how they deal with the uh, all too complex set of um, uh, regulations they have to deal with, but in doing so are actually having, uh, there's action, there's investment and it's investment grade. And so I think meet some of the, the things Veronica said. And then I already pointed out um, some of the negotiation between Lithium Americas, I think I got that right, and first the First Nations uh, in, in Canada. So there are um, there there are precedents. Um, of course, there's also I'm sorry to do this at the very end, but th there are also some really bad precedents. So you know, to to f to find the good ones is really important. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, Veronica, anything that you've seen on the on the good side of the ledger, best practices, things we can learn from, steps in the right direction? Yeah, this is something that's really important for our members and for mining companies. As I mentioned before, our mining has a really large footprint. And so we need to work very closely with our communities that we impact to make sure that we have that social license to operate. Um, I mentioned earlier that early and effective collaboration is key, and that needs to happen before production. You know, that's early in the exploration days is when things should be starting. Um, often companies that are end up producing that area don't have, uh, weren't the ones exploring it. So we need to work together. The entire sector needs to focus on this early and effective collaboration. At NMA, we have an ESG task force and resource sessions to really talk about the, the challenges that companies face on the ground to improve on the ground impact. And one of the, one of the topics that comes back uh, frequently each year is the relationship with indigenous um, peoples and communities and how to improve those relationships and make them be win-win. And we're actually, um, in two months, we're bringing uh, one of the coalitions, the Canadian coalitions, the Indigenous peoples, to talk to our companies about the successful partnerships that they've experienced with companies. Um, one of our members, Sabanier Stillwater, has their Good Neighbor Agreement, which has been widely acclaimed as a, as a great tool to engage with communities and a, an agreement to have with which communities. So we see positives out there and we're really hoping to share them so that more companies can be utilizing them. Thanks, Veronica. Uh, George, over to you for the, the last word. Anything you've witnessed uh, and experienced in, in your work at the State Department, things that you all are thinking about as potentially best practices and positive takeaways from uh, from, from your time working on this issue? I mean, I'll say, and, and actually just uh, touching on something Morgan had mentioned, the um, Energy Resources Governance Initiative, or ERGI, um, which is a State Department initiative and uh, continues to, 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 be, uh, to be around and working specifically with ministries around the world, mining ministries mostly, to, uh, to promote kind of First of all, an understanding of the importance of, um, of consultation, um, but just generally the trying to um, socialize in a way where it is embedded, the idea that we do need high ESG standards for the sector, which ultimately will help level the playing field so that some other potential investors that are less interested in, in those um, those standards um, don't don't essentially take our pie. Um, the um, the other piece of of Ergi is it also promotes that business certainty that uh, that companies need uh, and creates uh, ties between us and those governments to at least try to to influence from 
the the ground up potential uh, reforms, uh, potential ideas for for regulation, and um, and Erge is really a, a great example of of what we are doing um, around the world as far as technical assistance goes on that front. Thank you very much, George, and uh, thank you to to all three of our panelists. I think this is clearly a topic that uh, is, as we've all mentioned, only going to increase in importance. CSIS and particularly CSIS America's program has done uh, a number of uh, pieces on this. In fact, we just published one yesterday, a commentary called The Indispensable Industry, Mining's Role in the Energy Transition in the Americas. Uh, if you haven't read it, head on over to our site. It's there for, for you to read. Um, but thank you so much to our panelists for, for being here this morning, Dr. Morgan Bazilian a non-resident senior associate with the CSIS Energy Security and Climate Change Program, as well as executive director of the Payne Institute for Earth Resources, Veronica Chimay, Vice President of International Policy and Sustainability with the National Mining Association, and George Kayati, Foreign Affairs Officer and Critical Minerals Team Lead at the Office of Energy Transformation at the State Department. Again, thanks for spending your morning with us.